Fala aí pessoal, sejam bem-vindos a mais um episódio do Buzz Talk. Estamos aqui na semana do Grande Prêmio do Brasil, em um ambiente especial, com pessoas especiais. Eu sou Daniel Rodrigues. Eu vou... Oh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna give the introduction in Portuguese and then I'll be back to English. Estou aqui com meu amigo Caio. Tudo bom, Caio? Muito obrigado. Tudo bem, muito obrigado. É sempre um prazer estar aqui. Eu sempre começo assim, mas dessa vez o negócio está um pouco diferente. Está um pouco né? diferente. Não sei se é o cenário, se é esse ilustre convidado, não é. sei exatamente o que é, mas hoje a coisa está bem, tá bem bacana. Nosso convidado aqui, Mr. Norris. How Hello, obrigado. Oi, tudo bom? Uh, tudo bom, tudo, tudo, tudo bom? Tudo ótimo, tudo, bom? tudo ótimo. É, vamos então começar apresentando nossos parceiros é, Temos hoje dois parceiros especiais, a Exto e a Azul Mais são, É um oferecimento desses dois parceiros que são extremamente especiais A Exto está com a gente há uma longa data A Estapar, que é a Azul Mais, está com a gente aí é, a partir de agora é, Então a Exto, é, Exto Incorporação e Construção Uma empresa que há mais de 30 anos constrói lares e sonhos Somando mais de 80 empreendimentos na cidade de São Paulo Se você procura um apartamento nos bairros nobres como Perdizes Vila Romana, Moema, Brooklyn, Cidade Jardim, Butantã e Morumbi, vale a pena conferir as opções da Exto. Unidades prontas ou em construção para morar ou como uma ótima opção de investimento. Isso é verdade, é melhor você ir lá falar com eles. Assim como na Fórmula 1, a Exo sabe que engenharia de qualidade faz toda a diferença no resultado. Por isso, seu time trabalha incansavelmente para trazer o que há de melhor em apartamentos, plantas inteligentes, lazer e acabamento de altíssimo padrão. A vitória fica para os clientes. Isso não rola na Fórmula 1. Não fique para trás e encontre hoje seu apartamento dos sonhos em exto.com.br. Exto, construindo lares e sonhos. Escanei aqui o código de barra, entre no site da Exto, que é o melhor site que eu já vi. E vai trocar uma ideia com o pessoal lá, que vale a pena. E aí eu vou passar a bola aqui para o meu querido amigo Caio. Para anunciar o outro parceiro que embarcou com a gente nessa, é, nesse episódio, que é a Estapar. Tá? Para quem não conhece a Estapar, é a maior empresa de estacionamento da América Latina. E quando o assunto é estacionamento, eu tenho certeza que é a primeira empresa a vir na cabeça do brasileiro. Tá? E como de costume, a empresa continua inovando. Dessa vez com a Azul+, Mais, o aplicativo, a nova plataforma digital da Estapar. Tá? Por lá você reserva vagas nos principais estacionamentos e arenas do país. E o Daniels não conta para ninguém, mas se você é, reservar com antecedência, você ganha um descontaço. Você para na Zona Azul de São Paulo é, e de mais 22 cidades. Tá? Tudo por esse aplicativo agora, tá? não precisa mais do outro. E para melhorar ainda, você consegue consultar e parcelar em até 12 vezes, vou repetir, em até 12 vezes <risos> o, o, tudo que você está devendo do seu carro tudo, tá? Seja multa, IPVA, licenciamento, o que você quiser. Na roda. Falando em IPVA, janeiro tá aí e o IPVA tá chegando, então já aproveita, baixa o app da Azul+, Mais, porque além disso você tem mais, mais 15 funcionalidades, além dessa, tem um total de 20 funcionalidades no aplicativo, então baixa lá, confere, porque a Azul+, Mais tá aí para facilitar e simplificar a vida de quem dirige. Tá bom o que mais, né, Nilson? Tá ótimo, eu já baixei, vou te falar, cara. É, com a burocracia que a gente tem no Brasil... É... Muito fácil, você põe a placa do seu carro lá, ele já puxa qual que é o seu carro, já pega tudo, é, é assim, é, é muito bacana. Boa, é isso. So, back to English. Ah, não esquece, esse vídeo tem legenda, tá? Ele não tá direto no vídeo, então ativa a legenda no próprio YouTube. É... Vai estar tá aí tudo certinho. Não esquece de dar o like e se inscrever. Um agradecimento especial ao pessoal da Dami, conseguiu fazer isso acontecer. Dami Filmes, isso de última hora. Dá um like, se inscreve aí. Estamos tirando... Cara, tem dois dias de folga aqui no Brasil e o cara tirou uma horinha para falar com a gente aqui. Então, acho que vale a pena dar um like para ajudar a gente aí. Se inscreve no canal que vai vir muita coisa melhor. And back to English. How are you, man? Welcome to Brazil. Thank you. Um, I'm good. I think this is the most. This is Lando Norris, Formula One driver. Do I need to introduce myself? No. Uh? Do you want me to introduce? Oh yeah, myself? please go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm Lando Norris, <laughs> a Formula One driver for McLaren. Um, I'm 23. Uh, Whoa, how young? Around here in Brazil. Awesome. For, for the race weekend. Awesome, man. So, driver of the day in Mexico, over uh -huh. 20 overtakes, DOD. DOD. How, how <laughs> back to back DODs. Back to back DODs. Lots of ups and downs during the race as well. Yeah. Yes. Uh, obviously, the, the end result was great from, from where we started. Um, some bits were not looking good. You know, the red flag maybe... Actually, I think the red flag maybe helped a little bit. But um, then my restart was pretty bad. I had to avoid potentially having quite a few big crashes um but the, the main job is always to make sure you're in the race till the end right uh, make sure they're on the final lap and you see the checkered flag so 
uh yeah that was priority but then the the race was amazing to, to go from 14th to, to fifth the pace was great uh, was it your best race would you say or or not best i think like best managed race okay yeah it's tough because it depends how you see success right you can see success as a a win or a podium or a second place third place or you see success is did you kind of maximize everything you could on that day and um i would say yes from that point of view but it was just my best managed race from tire management fuel management heat management you know to cool the engine a lot in mexico because the it overheats so quickly so uh, mexico is not a race like who has the quickest car and then who can drive the car the best it's who can manage a everything in the best way and i think that's really what i did because i saw an interview of you before the before the mexican gp and you weren't very excited about it right i was excited i'm just i mean yeah, yeah. but like not very but optimistic for, res for results i was optimistic mm -hmm. um because we know i mean we know every weekend where we're going to be i think we have a good idea we don't always know but we have a good idea of where we're going to be good where we're going to struggle just because we know the strengths and weaknesses of the car right so we know mm -hmm. the car is very strong in fast corners um suzuka qatar very very strong um and where we lose most of our time is the slow speed is where we're not quick enough comparing to some of these other teams um so when you look at mexico from a just the layout it's a lot more slow speed uh and quite you know two three little sections of medium speed in the middle but not a lot um so when you look at it on paper it's a track we shouldn't be so good at um same kind of for for brazil but uh we were a little bit off in qualifying, you know, we were four tenths of pole, half a second almost of pole, which um, was probably a little bit more than we were expecting. Mm -hmm. um, but still, Oscar qualified sixth, I think, which was pretty decent for us. Um, and if I was up there too, then maybe Sunday could have been a little bit better again. Better, but yeah, yeah I, you just have good ideas of where you should be, when you shouldn't. So before the weekend, it's hard to go, especially because we've been on a good run of, what, four, four podiums in a row. It's hard to, and as much as I wish to just say, yeah, we can be on the podium again. I'm always a guy who's quite honest and just like, I don't think we're going to be on the podium, but if it turns out we do end up, then it's it's great. It's a plus. It's a big plus, yeah. So uh, I saw that Mexico, is, I think it's the, the, the track that you get the, the fastest speed. Yeah. Right? But you still using high downforce because of the air. M yeah, it's your maximum downforce. Yeah. Maximum downforce. Yeah. How, what is the difference? like Monaco um, settings, right? Pretty like, much. Mm -hmm. What is the difference like from like driving from, from Monza to to Mexico, yeah. like being the fastest track with the highest downforce, is there a big difference in driving? Um, I would say like the car still handles better in a way. Um, Cause char characteristics of like how the car works is different from when it's high downforce and low downforce, but also from when you have a high downforce setting versus a low downforce setting, or you have a high downforce setting like we have in Mexico, but the downforce is still lower than what you have in Monza. And the wing difference, you know, you see like a picture of mm -hmm. the rear wing here in Mexico is like this versus in Monza is, you know, it's like this, it's tiny. Um, but we still have a lot less grip than we have in uh, even in Monza. So the car still handles a little bit differently. The tires work differently. The temperatures and everything work quite differently. Um, so you understand that quite quickly, but it's the big problems are like braking and... Um, you know the how you set up the car with the, the the downforce and the the bottoming and things like that. So um, it's complicated, but I would say more complicated for the engineers rather than for me for as you. the driver. Yeah. yeah. Talking more about the race, like when you on that second start, yeah. When you when you're falling falling off, you know, didn't I? You didn't have a good start, no. or was like something you were avoiding? How how can you keep your head in place? Like you know that it's I, I for me it's looking from outside with any driver I imagine like the driver like screaming like no I like was. <laughs> <laughs> I was it's more like swear words and cuss words but uh, it's tough because I knew the pace was strong right um, and we already lost two positions because we boxed yeah the lap before the red flag um, so I lost to uh, Sonoda and I lost to Hulkenberg. Um, they stayed out and then with the red flag, you get to change the tires yeah. for free. So we lost out two positions. So I was already a little bit like mm, mm -hmm. frustrating, but I, I thought I could still, still, uh, get them. Um, but then it's tough because yeah, it's a long run down to turn one. So as soon as your start is a little bit worse, you can easily lose more than yeah. one position, two positions, three positions. Um, but I had the Williams on the right. I had a Haas, I think, or Alpine on the left, but both of them kind of didn't think of the other driver on the other side. Mm -hmm. So I'm in the middle of the day coming across. But it's tough because you don't want to back out, right? You don't want to be the guy who backs out and 
because you don't want that reputation of, ah, oh, he's going to back out. Because <laughs> um, one day it changes and then it turns yeah. into a crash. You almost never want that. that, um, that I guess it was hap people. what happened in the first lap with the two Red Bulls and Leclerc, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, this was just, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, it's tough. But you have to have the mentality of, I still want to be there for the for the final lap and make sure if there's another red flag or another safety car, you still have opportunities to get it back, right? Mm -hmm. So sometimes you have to give up something to win something back in the future. And I think that was a lot about this race. Um, but when I was 14th, like if you asked me at that point, do you think you can finish, I would say even in the top seven, eight, I would have said it was quite tricky to go from, from, from 14th even to the 10th. Because mm -hmm. to pass both Alpines, I think, the Haas, the um the alpha Tauri, that was only to get back into like ninth place so it was a uh, yeah i think difficult for anyone to think of but just the pace was very strong and it's still what 40 laps to go mm -hmm. so yeah it was right in the middle of the race yeah. like th lap 35 and we had the mediums left so it was like do you think you can get 40 laps on the medium which was a bit at that point we didn't kind of believe we could um but the Ferrari did a long stint on the first one. I think Charles mm -hmm. did uh, 30 laps, almost 30 laps on on the medium. So that maybe gave us a little bit more hope. But it's always hard. As much as you prepare for everything, there's still always a lot of unanswered questions until you get there. So it's it's difficult to, yeah, maybe be as prepared as what you want to be sometimes. What do you think about this um, this thing that you can like change everything in the car during red flag? Do you think you should change the, that? It depends. Sometimes you win. Sometimes so, yeah, you sometimes, you win, sometimes you lose. <laughs> I feel... I, for me, most of the time, I feel like I've lost out. Yeah. Um, just because I've been in that position, not because I, I think it's wrong or right. Um, you know, it just depends because sometimes we box early and then two laps later, there's a red flag. And then you're like, well, now I've just missed that 10 positions. Uh -huh. But sometimes you'll be that one guy who stays out on a hard tire and does a really long first in. He comes out and you're like, mega, you know, the uh -huh. pit stop. And so it, it's tough. Um, I've how is the, just been on the bad side of it, so maybe how is the, com the like the communication? Like I see now with the new management of Formula One that it's it, it, they're quite open to trying new things. Yeah, but it, are the drivers involved in in those things? Like let's say more than half of the grid don't like that thing. Like do you do you communicate and and you know they uh, they yeah. they listen and try to change? I mean, we have the a group a GPDA, um, which is run by uh, Alex Words. The old yeah. uh, XF1 driver. Um, so it, it's definitely a time when all of the drivers, I would say, are more um, harmonious and together than ever before, from what I've seen. Um, and and we try and have an input. You know, it's not like we get to decide everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes we feel like we want to decide more things because we're the ones driving the cars. We know what's best. Mm -hmm. um, maybe not from every perspective. You know, from like a a business perspective, sometimes you don't want to see it from that way because we don't think about the business of Formula One. We just think of what's going to almost make the best racing, what's going to make it more exciting for us and closer for us. And so we think a lot like this, but we don't, as drivers, necessarily think about the business of Formula One. Mm -hmm. um, but as much of as as much of uh, what is possible, we try and influence and have our own opinion and say we think it should be more like this or we think we should change it to this and so forth. And that can go from how the weekends work in terms of the sprint races versus um, um, amount of interviews and mm -hmm. amount of TV stuff and um, planning for weekends and things like that. So uh, rules, track layouts, you know, there's there's a lot of things that are involved that we are we are involved in and we try and have an input, but it and yeah. do you like to all meet up like on a race weekend or like yeah. so yeah. You meet and have, we have a, a chat? WhatsApp WhatsApp group? Uh, so everyone's on that. Um, and uh, yeah, and then we have meetings after the drivers' briefings. Normally, we have all the drivers stay for another 10, 20, half an hour, whatever minutes, and we'll have a chat about whatever it is. Cool. Coming into Brazil, um, before asking you about the GP, that I'm a yeah. bit biased, I think Interlagos is super cool. Mm -hmm. But uh, what do you like most about Brazil? Like, I I, th I guess it's your fifth time here, something like that. Maybe it's your fourth race, yeah, but like fourth. Thanks, man. Um, fourth race, but you came once in. I came once for one day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no, you came once for one day. Yeah. And then you came. I think that was were... my first time ever. Yeah, yeah. For, yeah, exactly. Then you went to Macau, and we met up in Macau afterwards. Exactly. So 2018 was my first time, but I I didn't go to the track. 
I arrived, they canceled the test, and I went straight back home. <laughs> so I only went to my hotel room and back to the airport. He got to the hotel room, got in the bathtub. Yeah, I had a bath. He was he was reading the... the, the... Yeah, then got a text, canceled, <laughs> and that was it. Um, then we were in Macau. Uh, and then we went like, straight to yeah, Macau. Yeah, I was with I was David in Macau. The first few days, but I ended up doing all of, all of the Macau race. Uh, you were lucky there because the car was there, right? Like yes. you were planning to go to Macau, and then the test came up, and then yeah, the exactly. test was cancelled. So I was I was lucky for Macau, but still, then I missed like at that time was still one of my first time in first times in a Formula One car. It was out on a new track that I'd never been to before, so I was looking forward to it. Of course, every every Japan's gonna look forward to it. And then you get there, you do the whole plane <laughs> journey, and then you're like, yeah, it's cancelled, and uh, then I left. So let's cross the world now. <laughs> yeah, then I have to go all the way back to Macau. So. Um, yeah, maybe fourth or fifth time, but what do I say is the best? Um, apart from you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, man. <laughs> uh, what is it? Um, I wouldn't say I've explored a lot of Brazil. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. It's not like I've done loads of things, but out of the few things that I have done, which is say coming here or going to support Palmeiras. Churrasco. Um, uh-huh. Palmeiras barbecue. He's São Paulo. He's he's he yeah, lost. Not, he lost. Yeah, five. I came in late to this party. I they lost. They I lost couldn't. five nil to us last week. Okay, sorry. Keep going. It's all right, mate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but like doing that, like I've enjoyed all my moments here. You know. Um, so from the people that I know and um, the places I've been, the food, you know, the restaurants and yeah. stuff, it's a bit of a different experience to London or a lot of other places in Europe. And um, that's normally what you like. You like the difference. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of the places when you go to Europe are kind of the same-ish. So when you go to somewhere else that's different and a different vibe, then it's it's enjoyable. So, yeah. How would you describe like the the people here, like the fans, uh, comparing to other places? Yeah. Like, um, not necessarily comparing, but you, you have the feeling that the uh, that Formula One has been around in Brazil for a long time. You know, yeah. you have that like historic feeling. Mm -hmm. Maybe because of Ayrton. I don't know if it's just because of him or what, but you have the feeling that the F1 fans here really love Formula One and they have done for a very long time. It's not like it's suddenly a new audience because of Netflix and all of these things. It's not like suddenly it's like this. Mm -hmm. I feel like for many, many years, it's been one of the places that the fans and people here have been most interested in Formula One. Yeah. So you get that historic feeling that people are there because they love racing, they love the smell, the sound, they love to watch the races. Um, they're just like more raw, raw passion, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, but also lovely. I, I, I mean, I don't know why. But <laughs> I have a, I would say a lot of supporters here. You know, when you do the track parade, mm -hmm. there's a lot of people who are shouting my name and supporting me and cheering me on, which is always a nice thing. Um, which is yeah, always nice to have in whatever country. But uh, here in Brazil, again, because of the history of support of Formula One drivers, then it's yeah, I, I agree with you, and I guess that. Um, you know, like back in the day, you know, at Ayrton Times and, you know, all the other drivers, Nelson, Emerson. Yeah. Um, I mean, these guys also helped to to give Brazil, like put Brazil in, in the map, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not only Pele did it, but like Formula One is a completely different sport, yeah. you know. F football is a bit more popular. Uh, Formula One is a bit different. So like for like Brazilians to win, like a few yeah. world championships. Senna came in a, in a in a time that the country was going really bad, like yeah. politically and stuff. So, so he was like helped the whole. He was kind country. of the only yeah, like the moral the of the whole, country, yeah. you know. Yeah. So cool, I think though. yeah, of course it is. Yeah. I mean, and he's a world hero. I mean, not only a Brazilian everyone knows hero. That too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like it's, yeah, you go to the McLaren pit stops. There's always a picture yeah. of of Senna there, and exactly. I mean, yeah. And if you go to like Japan, like he's, he's still kind of kind of bigger there than here in Brazil. Of course not, but it's <laughs> pit stops know the boxes. Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but I know what you mean. Yeah, but like, yeah. that's I think what makes it special, right? Mm -hmm. Is that they love Ayrton, then they love racing. Um, I think Ayrton was special. Of course, I did. I never knew him or anything, but. When you hear the stories about him and things like that, then you knew he was a very special person. Mm -hmm. um, for someone to have the influence on a whole country, yeah, I think it's quite unique. Um, have you seen like the the video of his like of his funeral? No, maybe I've seen of the, it's like the documentary it's, it's and unbelievable. Yeah, there's a yeah. Senna documentary. Like the whole country was Stop, stopped. Like yeah. was my like, dad went to the funeral yeah, as well. He didn't like know him at all for, for a week. Yeah, you drove one of his car, right? Uh, yes, I drove the Suzuka. I think it's championship winning car or the one that he crashed into Prost. 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 Yeah. You drove it in, in Goodwood? In Goodwood. How was it? It's incredible. Like the difference now of Formula One car 
now versus then is is completely different. It doesn't even feel like Formula One. Um, I mean, it's H pattern, but like the cockpits are tiny. No, and like you're, now there's a like lot of space. Shoulders, shoulders, shoulders off, but right? The, yeah, you're like, yeah. No, you can do this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you can spread out, and like now you're you're strapped in, you can't move. Someone's overtaking it, like yeah, you can you can hit them out the way, <laughs> move the wing mirror. Um, it's just it's a completely completely different feeling. It's a lot more like raw. Um, they were like suspension wasn't yeah. that good and everything, so you feel every bump. No power steering, H pattern, like it's a different challenge. I would say. I, I, it's hard to know if I can just say it's easier or harder or whatever. I don't think that's a, a question I can answer, but it's just a completely different type of Formula One car, a different challenge. Um, now I say that mentally there's a lot more going on with all the buttons and switches and being on top of all of that. Then you didn't have all of it, but you had more things to focus on from a driver perspective of controls. So, mm -hmm. but it was, I was so scared. I hate driving yeah. other people's cars. <laughs> Uh, just because it's not my thing, so I was like, I'm so nervous to, to drive it, <laughs> like to damage it, and, and to do anything, especially in good of it when people are watching. I'm like, don't, don't mess <laughs> it up. Whole world's watching. Don't mess it up. Um, Did you feel sane it or no? No, I, I wish, I wish, I still want to go onto a track, yeah, and just let it go, you know, and just go flat out and feel what it's like. Um, this car you drove was already pedal shifts, or no, was it? H. It's, oh my. H pattern, H -pattern yeah. like yeah, so, completely different. Like, I think so. Right foot braking and heel and toe and like I, I mean, right I did foot braking Ginetta and stuff, huh? Right foot braking. Is it not right foot brake or left foot brake? No, well. you right foot brake and then clutch. No. Ah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a uh, how do you say uh, punta taco? Yeah, like uh, how do you he say heel and toe. Like, heel, yeah. yeah, heel and toe. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's a different. How are, how are those cars kept? Are are they at the McLaren headquarters? Some, uh, then they have like the historic department, which look after all of them. Um, the main ones, I think, all still kept by by McLaren, mm -hmm. um, which is incredible. When you see like yeah, I saw the video. history of it all, yeah. you see from... There's an old video of, I think it's uh, Jensen Button and Alonso, like they're like exploring. It's a McLaren yeah. video, they're exploring yeah, yeah. the place and then they take out the Senna. All the covers. Yeah. And, you know, it's just on the side somewhere, you'd be like, oh, which one's this? <laughs> and it's just another championship car. Or it's like, wow, this is like that's I think one of the very special things about McLaren is the hit, like the history of it, for um, sure. And the people who have been yeah. there and won things and done things with McLaren. That's it makes it pretty cool to be. What happens if you like if if you crash one of those cars? Like they 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 build no no not you but like if someone crashes it like they, yeah. they build again like the parts that they're needed or I. Th uh, you're gonna charge you something for sure. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, 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 not, not this. Like, <laughs> if they need to do like something that they don't have anymore, because I imagine they have. I would have like thought so. I don't actually know. I would have thought so that they could. They still have a lot of spare parts. Like, you know, they have warehouses of just spare oh. bits for every single car. You don't want to ask because if if they said they had spare parts, you would full send it. Yeah. <laughs> but now I know there's a, well, some of them I'm sure there's a lot less. Some there's a lot. It depends what year of the regulations and things it was, but. I will never crash it, so uh, yeah. I won't find out. Yeah, cool. oh, I knew it. It was just... <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, coming back now, can you say, Brazil, that it's your third nation? Third, third nation. Third nation. Um, and third, just so you don't know, his dad is British and his mom is Belgian. Yeah. So, we cannot be the second. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I say is... Are we third? fighting with Monaco? <laughs> no. No, I mean, Monaco is great, but I... I don't like, yeah, I'm not growing up there. It's not, not my home um, that I was born in or anything, you know, so uh, I don't know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'll, I'll, I'll leave you to that one. Now, going back like to Brazil, like the sprint race, we, we spoke about like the regulations and stuff. What do you think about the sprint race? Do you enjoy it? Um, I would say last year was a bit more... I don't know because last year was was still qualifying for. I think it was still it was still qualifying, was still for, the qualifying for the race. Yes, last year. I that think that was cooler. Separate, like separate. I, I don't know in your guys' point of view, but for a fan, I think it was cooler. Last year. Yeah. Mm. So the the bit I love about it is Friday mm -hmm. practice qualifying. Yeah. Straight in. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's something generally that suits me quite well. Uh, I I feel like I'm good at being able to jump in the car find the limit and, and get close to the limit quite quickly so i think it generally suits me in terms of my my style of just 
the less practice you have almost mm -hmm. and just go straight in, I feel almost more confident in the, in this way. Every driver in Formula One is good enough that once you do FP1, FP2, FP3, then you go into qualifying to perform at a very, very close level from first to last. Um, of course, there's always going to be differences, but everything is a lot closer than when you just have practice quality. Um, so I enjoy that. I think it's more challenging for us. I think it was a lot more challenging for the teams to set the cars up in, in a good way. Um, the sprint race, then tough. Not not so much. Uh, Honestly, I like the the little... The little the black... Plate, yeah, black yeah. yeah. It's cool. I don't know. I just don't have the same feeling as, as Sunday. Um, so, like, I love Friday and I love Sunday. So <laughs> Saturday is, is... I mean, you still have another qualifying, which I enjoy qualifying always. Um just you know low fuel max power max grip it's just always good fun like that the sprint races generally we've always done quite well at so i don't want to say i hate it again but it's it's not my favorite um the reason we have it is for the fans it's for yeah. you guys watching it's for everyone watching so if you want to put on a real show then maybe you do a reverse grid or something um you have it for i don't know some points or some prize money or something you still want it to mean something enough to the teams and to the drivers to want to really put all the effort in possible you know if it's a race for no points or, or prizes then it's like you know you're using the engines you're you're burning a lot of things like it's it's you feel like it's a little bit wasted mm -hmm. um so yeah maybe there's still some things to try and improve on yeah if i if i crown you now mr lando norris yeah. you're the president of fia and f1 what oh, how <laughs> <laughs> what is the ideal format for you like what, what would you do if it's mm -hmm. only you you decide What like I do. Having like Mario Kart bananas. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, I don't know, it's tough. Like I love, of course I want everything to be as close as possible, but I think what makes Formula One so special is the teams. The teams do their own thing. It's not a one-make series. And I think that's what makes Formula One just more you know, head to head, driver to driver, team to team. I think it adds a lot more to the whole event and to the whole sport. Um, but of course you want it close, but then it, You don't want it to be all the same cars and all of this kind of stuff. Um, and there's always been teams who have dominated for, since the beginning of Formula yeah. One, you know? It's not like suddenly we've never seen it before. And now, you know, Mercedes were dominating a few years ago. Now Red Bull are dominating. Um, I don't know. I feel like there's a lot more talk of it now, the last few years, than there was maybe 20 years ago. Um, people just seem to get more, I think in the world, more bored quickly mm -hmm. or more excited quickly. Um, when it's good versus when it's bad. So you have the differences, but uh, if you want to show for the fans, you have like a reverse grid. I think that's probably the best thing. Ah, you can have. Um, it's just always going to be exciting. Yeah. You're never going to almost not want to watch it because when you have, you know, McLaren, Ferrari, Red Bull, Mercedes at the back, and then they're racing, but they're also racing to come through and you give all the people up with some opportunities of, yeah, it would be amazing. of success. Yeah, racing wise. Um, because it's tough when you come into Formula One and you think, You know, if you join a team that's not competitive, um, it's tough because it's tough to, to work so hard to not feel like you get a lot back, if that makes sense. So if you, you put in all the effort, you do all the training, you work as hard as you can to make yourself the best driver you can, but the car's not quick enough and you finish 15th, 17th, 18th every weekend, it's, it is still a tougher thing to motivate yourself every single weekend. Um, uh Yeah, and it's hard because you just don't feel like you get much back in, in return for the amount of effort that gets put into things. So you've then had a reverse grid and one of those guys can go on to win the reverse grid race and things like that. I think it's a cool opportunity for those people. So it's so exciting for us to try and come through a bit like Mexico. It's enjoy, it's a lot of fun. You're racing, you're battling. It's what you really you love about weekends and you love about racing. Um, but I say it still doesn't affect the championship. Mm -hmm. I still want like the main qualifying and Sunday to be the, yeah, the, the event. events, the, event. yeah. the thing that people want to attend and see every weekend. Because uh, I still believe that's just what makes Formula One special. It's just that build up that you have the qualifying, you get excited and everyone's there Sunday and mm. the event of the whole week and of the month, whatever it is. Um, I still love that. So maybe mixing those things together mm. somehow. Yeah, for me, to be very honest, like this, this weekend was one of, one of the weekends that I paid more attention to the race because it was like literally two races. 
um, mm. here in, in Mexico because the, yeah, the, the Red Bull came, came right in the middle and then everyone was on new tires yeah. and like it was another race and then yeah. it, it started all over again. I mean, of course, this is not something that should be implemented, but it was pretty cool. Like, yeah. um, but I think it just adds more excitement. Yeah. More, yeah. more questions, more unknowns for everyone. You're like, oh, maybe Max won't win a race again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you get excited for that nowadays. Yeah, exactly. More than will he win? You're like, oh, come on, maybe he won't win again. So, <laughs> Yeah, I think it was a good race, a good event. Um, I enjoyed the races in Mexico. They're tough, but uh, one of the places I enjoy it. And uh, specifically about Interlagos, what do you and the team expect? Like, I think it's still... It's a hard, it's a hard race. I think it's no? still going to be a tricky one for us. Um, a tricky one for us is quite a power... I don't know what the words are for it. Power reliant. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, you need good good engines on yeah. this type of circuit, um, which I'm a little bit down on. Uh, I, lo I lost my first engine of the season mm -hmm. in the first race of the season. <laughs> so I've always been like... You, you lost the engine? Yeah, the engine was ah, okay. finished. Um, after one race, you had three for the season, and that was my first one gone. So for the rest of the year, I've had, I've had to compromise with only two, mm -hmm. which means some races and for a short period, I'll have maybe a, a tiny, tiny bit more. I'm never really at an advantage to anyone, but there are some races where I'm a little bit of a, mm -hmm. at a small disadvantage in terms of power. Um, Do you keep switching between the two? No, right? You are can you, switch. You can? So you, you want to sometimes save your best engine for the power-related circuits, okay. like Brazil, and circuits like you know Monaco and street circuits where you don't need as much power um, and makes less difference, then you put those. Is, is that, that, that difference... In manufacturing, is like a yeah. What do you mean by the, on the manufacturing of the engine? What is where is the what do you mean difference? by the best engine? But it's just because with uh, with time it gets a little bit worse. Ah, okay. So oh, okay. You, tiny bits, but the when newer you, one, yeah. You talk about tiny bits, like mm -hmm. it's it's a lot. <laughs> yeah, half a tenth. Mm -hmm. Um, if you just want half a tenth, it's nice to have half a tenth. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, for for some races, um, you you for the ones you don't want your best engine in, you want to put a lot of miles on this one. And then you want to save the one for the the power related circuits. You, you keep it the most fresh, basically. So mm -hmm. it's just between new and old, they just get a little tiny, tiny bit worse over time. Um, and especially when you get to the end of the season, if you were to put like a new one in all of a sudden, then it makes quite a big difference. So say for probably Yuki this weekend when he puts a new he put a new power unit in, I think um, he would have that, that tiny little advantage over some people. I'm not sure if Daniel did the same, but he he didn't. He did well. He qualified so. well. Mm -hmm. um, but Yuki, I think they, I don't know if he had a bad qualifying and then they decided or he decided straight away. I think they decided straight away that he was going to do it. I don't know if maybe he, he finished two engines already and sometimes you have a crash, the engine's finished. Sometimes you just have problems and it's finished. Um, but it's also a cost penalty for, for the whole team. You know, it comes out of the budget cap if you have to use more engines and things like that. So um, you pay the price at the same time. Otherwise, you'd like put a new one mm -hmm. in every, every weekend. <laughs> So talking about performance, like how how would you sum up the year? Like how the hell is that possible? Going what, from, we, what the team from have done? Zero to here. Yeah. Right? <laughs> um, like what what was the expectation before the before the the season and like how did that light? Oh, okay, let's bring some new parts and yeah. podium, podium. I think podium. before the year we we were it was hard, but it was very we, had, we were very honest and we said it's not going to be the best start of the year because You're we hardly new. changed. Yeah. We hardly changed much over the winter. Um, there were some little things to make the car a bit quicker, but nothing now is a revolution, which was like half a second, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but towards the end of the winter, we kind of found a better path to, to go with, um, which was the, the first floor we bought to Baku, and then we bought uh, the, the main upgrade to, uh, to Austria. Um, but that was stuff, like our Austria upgrade was, say, stuff that was already being planned end of the winter, like going into Feb January, February, March time. That's how long it takes still to, to get to that point. Um, there were some changes, obviously, that happened within the team and things like that. But um, like I said, the upgrade we had for Austria was already in development, end of the winter, you know, beginning of the season. Um, we just wanted to make sure it was one that we could put on the car and it was like, boom, mm -hmm. a step. Um, were you expecting that step? Not as much as what it turned out to be. Uh, um, I think it was a time also when, you know, Aston started the season off very, very strong. 
and they've just tailed off a little bit because every other team is probably progressing. Maybe they've not progressed or struggled with some things. I'm not sure. Um, but I think what made the biggest difference was just the jump of positions was huge. Mm -hmm. Like the lap time gain was still a lot. It was, I don't know what we said at the time, like four tens, five tens, four tens, I think. But we went to Austria, which is a track we always do well at every, every season. Um, and some of the teams maybe struggle a little bit. So we went from like 16th, 17th to suddenly being, I think, fifth. And we made, made, we made a step of like four tens, but it was like 12 positions mm -hmm. suddenly that we jumped forward. And that's what caught everyone off by surprise mm -hmm. so much was that Aston struggled a little bit more and maybe Ferrari struggled a little bit more. And then we just went the opposite way. Mm -hmm. And then we looked like <laughs> we looked like heroes all of a sudden. I think it was like one of the best, like, um, uh, not upgrades, but the best like step ups I've ever seen. Hundred percent. Yeah, it's from, it was just from unbelievable. The time I've seen in Formula One, the the lap time, but also positional change that we made was was huge. Mm -hmm. um, but it's clear that we've we've caught every team. We've caught Red Bull as well. It's not like we've Red Bull are also there and we've taken a step up. Comparing to everyone, we've got closer. Um, we got closer to winning races and things like that. Um, but a lot of it is just like mentality and understanding of the car and priorities mm. of development. Um, it's a very, very complicated thing. You mm. know, when, you, when you go there and um, when you get taken through how many things have to come together to make a good team mm -hmm. and a good car, uh, it's, it's incredible how complex it can be. Um, but also sometimes making things simple and just going... Let's forget about trying to be too clever and too smart and come up with mm -hmm. tricks. Sometimes it's like, let's just get the basics. Let's take a wheel out. Right, yeah. Lighter. <laughs> Instead of trying to do this, like the magic every now and then, sometimes it's good to just go, right, let's reset. Let's try and understand things again. And then you go from there. And that's a little bit what we did um, by taking so long to develop the car in the winter and into the beginning of the year um, to where we are now, which was, mm. uh, which was huge. And to do that in the budget cap, you know, in a time when it's almost harder than ever to make improvements, We've made one of the biggest probably seen in the last, I don't know, as long as I can remember of watching Formula One um, in terms of going from where we were to where we are now is, is huge. So yeah, t talking about like complexity and uh, and development, like people don't really know the complexity of Formula One. Yeah. Like when I'm watching races with friends, they don't really know, like understand the difference between like Formula Two and Formula One. And then yeah. I say, listen, this Formula Two car, it's they use it for like, I think it's five years or six yeah. years, the same car, the team has two cars. Formula One, they literally get a, a book of words uh -huh. and they <laughs> transform it into a car every yeah. year. Yeah. Like how, how does that development works? Like how, how from, from the moment you get a book, yeah. the team gets so the book to the, the moment the thing is there, like you can see it. Um, that's a long period. That's a, it's a long, long time. Because uh, obviously you don't just get it at the end of the year and suddenly you go, okay, we have to suddenly create something, you know. Already for say 26 2026 is the next regulation change and there's a lot of changes with the power unit and engine side but also some things with the car um, yeah, just so people understand like we the, the regulation the, the main regulation yeah. is it less what it's five four years five years something like that four years for five, year, yeah. five years so when you see like differences in in the car the big differences it's that change of regulation but in yes. the middle of that there are like up, up, updates to the regulation yeah exactly so there's there's things every year kind of which are updates which the team have to comply with then every few years, just because of science and development, mm -hmm. there's like a, a safer car that everyone needs to go to or a more efficient engine that everyone has to go to and things like that. Um, it's getting windy. Yeah, it's getting windy. Sao Paulo, welcome to Sao Paulo, guys. <laughs> um, but it takes a lot, it takes years. It's not months. Uh, it takes years to, to be ready to be on top of all of these things. Um, and there's a group of, you know, 800 people uh, but from a lot of different departments that work on all of these things. But like, they go from the drawings. But like Formula One or, or each team? Uh, McLaren is around this number. 800. Some people less, some people maybe more, like Red Bull, Mercedes, Ferrari probably more. Um, but 800 from, but from a lot of obviously different departments. Yeah. You know, that's probably including, I don't know if that includes marketing or not include marketing and things, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's a hurricane coming <laughs> technical problems um but there's there's so many people and so many clever people that like you said take literally words of it can't be bigger than this and it has to be like this shape and this and so on and transforming that into their own idea 
and then you have every part of a car right so it's not just who can make the best front wing but the front wing has to perfectly work in harmony with the middle part of the car the car the floor the side pods the engine cover then that has to work perfectly with the, the rear wing the rear brake ducts the rear diffuser you know like everyone works in their own department but everyone also has to know what everyone's doing and put this together with this together like it's it's such a complicated project it's like a puzzle it's a puzzle but everyone but it works has on their connected. own thing but also needs to understand how f the puzzle is going to come together mm -hmm. and you almost don't really see the puzzle come together until you know maybe a, a month or a few weeks before when it has to be actually revealed to to the world but like the teams receive like the updates and regulations like mid-season more or less for you to start sometimes to, to it plan. can be mid-season yeah there might be suddenly a mid-season because people you always want to push Prepare the car yourself, as yeah. much as possible. So mm -hmm. Sometimes there's like a gray area, mm -hmm. which you try and push, and then maybe the, the FIA is like, um, you have to do it like this, and then everyone has to kind of change it a little bit. Um, but it's tough because you want, Formula One is about development, and it's about teams and innovation and technology. I think that's what makes Formula One so special is it is a, it's a world leader in terms of technology and innovation from this department. Yeah. Um, you know, it was it brought the carbon tubs to the world, mm -hmm. Formula One and mm -hmm. McLaren, um, and a lot of technology, and especially from like the power unit side of things, that is in everyone's cars nowadays. A lot of it is is led by Formula One, for sure. Um, and uh, Formula One engines are some of the most, or I say, the most efficient engines in the world, um, because it innovates and it's a leader of these things. In, in essence, is also helping change the world and, and make better things for the world. Um, and Formula One will be net zero by 2030. Right? Exactly. The good thing is that it's an innovator in the world and there's not many other sports which innovate and, and create solutions um, for world change and that help everyone's cars around the world be more efficient and mm -hmm. thermally be more efficient and all of these things and create better biofuels and stuff like this. Um, there's a lot of stuff that everyone has in their cars at yeah. home nowadays yeah. which have been led and, and changed because of Formula 1 and I think that's just something very special yeah I was watching the race this weekend with a with a friend and he was like oh it's so sad that Formula 1 would be electric one day I yeah. said no it's not going to be electric no gonna I hope be, it's not they're not going to kill the combustion <laughs> yeah we all hope not but the, the intention is not to kill the combustion yep. but kill the pollution exactly that's so, the problem yeah. right mm -hmm. that's the problem um, but uh, we're getting that you're ready like the fuels we use now are some of the best fuels you can use in the world for efficiency um, but there's there's every section of you know the fuels and engine and the chassis and strength of things and safety so many things come from formula one and um, at the same time you want all of this but you want to push the limits of every single one of these subjects mm -hmm. to create the quickest and the best car you can you can design yeah i wanted to know can though, you just ask I mean, one, one question regarding the, yeah, yeah. the development of the car uh, how much input do the drivers have like when when do you do, do like Mr. Zach Brown call, hey Lando, <laughs> like we're doing the next year car. Like what uh -huh. is your input? What do you do? Like you sit in a sim, in a simulation of the car, like um, for all drivers, like. It, it depends. Like, of course I have nothing to do with a design and things like this. Um, I just have direction. Mm -hmm. I have direction and input of, I want the car to be a little bit more like this. Mm -hmm. I want the car to be a little bit more like that. Um, how you then translate that and get that into an actual, physical thing is something that's very complicated and it's not an easy thing um cars you always want to design to be the quickest and then you have to drive the quickest and i'd much rather have that than a car that's really nice to drive but slow right um and in the end of the day it's the driver's job to drive whatever car they get given mm -hmm. right i can't just go oh the car doesn't suit me um uh that's why i'm doing bad you know i, I think it's what makes a Formula One driver the best drivers in the world is that they can drive whatever car in the world or whatever way and be one of the best at, at doing so. Um, but of course, you want a quick car and you want to make it as much like your own car uh, and you want to feel as comfortable as you can to push those limits as possible. Almost part um, of you, right? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. You just want to feel like you jump in it and you're just going for like a Sunday drive. The more you can do that, I th for me, like the better I do. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I get nervous and I'm like, I, I have to think of driving the car is normally when I do a bad job. I'm just not flowing, right? Mm -hmm. but when I can just jump in and I'm just, I don't even think of driving. I just go out and I'm just, 
you know, I'm just driving. Mm -hmm. I don't think Cruise. braking and turning. I'm just, you're just in a groove. Then um, that's normally when I perform at my best. And that's when uh -huh. I'm most comfortable. But yes, there's, there's things like, you know, I want the car to be better off the brakes. Mm. Or I want to be able to brake later and the tires not lock and things like this. Then there's certain things that they can maybe do to lean in that direction. Um, but it's not like I go, can you do this? And then next weekend, they're like, there you go, Lando. And here it is. <laughs> it's, it's not as simple as that. Um, Because in the end of the day, you just want them to make the quickest car. Quer fechar aqui atrás, ó? Se der pra fechar aqui, ó. Fica melhor. Well, if you've seen a race in São Paulo. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure about you, but I hope it rains. Yeah, I hope it does. But, so, I mean, going back to that question, I mean, I want to know about, like, Lando yeah. off the track and also, like, um, about mental health. I, I, yeah. It looks like I've seen past in interviews of you saying that, like, you really do care about mental yeah. health. And so how do you treat, uh, like, how do you take care of that? And, I mean, physical conditioning, yeah. everything, I mean. Um, so a lot of it just comes, uh, I'll start with the physical side. I think physically Formula One is a lot harder than what people think it is. Um, it's quite specific. You know, it's not like you just want to be big and muscular and all this. That's mm -hmm. not how it works. There's certain things you need to be very strong in. Um, you know, from like your neck and, and core, your legs. Um, you need to have more resistance, right? Like yeah, exactly. More than um, and again, if you're thinking of these things while driving, you're thinking, oh, my, my neck's going like, you're going to be driving slower. Fact. Mm -hmm. Um So there's a lot of specific things. That's why I don't look the biggest guy in the world. There's also a weight limit, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, so you have to stick within these weight limits. That's why you don't see maybe massive muscles on Formula One drivers. And it's almost a benefit at times to be slightly smaller. Um, so there's a lot of that. And a lot of it is um, being able to deal with heat very well. Uh, you know, we had the race in Qatar a few weeks ago, which was by far the hardest race I've, I've ever done. Yeah, for uh, everyone. In any car. Yeah. Um, do you kind of real? Do you, do you finish? No, I'm kind of <laughs> sorry. Go on. No, no, no. <laughs> no, I was gonna ask like, do, do you kind of realize that the uh, that uh, how tired you are after the race? Yeah, like you finish the race like, yeah, fuck. yeah. Like, like the the cool down lap, it felt like the longest cool down lap in my life. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, physically, Formula One is very tough, and yeah. and not just because of physically, but also mentally to concentrate so hard, um, knowing that. You do like, especially on a track like Monaco or Singapore, you misjudge something by 10 centimeters and it's sober. It's game over. Like you can be in a wall, you can have a big crash. Um, and, uh, it's raining a lot. It's huh? raining. Yeah. <laughs> dá pra fechar esse Será todo? Será que dá pra fechar aqui atrás? Pergunta lá, Pevi. So, help. Like, If we knew it was this easy, right? We could have, <laughs> we could have closed before, no? <laughs> But I mean... And how do you... What do you do, like, to prepare mentally? Like, what is your mental process? My mental process. Like, um, um, like, do you have a like therapy or something? Yeah. I mean, yeah. So I have a. Because pressure is intense therapy, in the sports. Mental coach, mm -hmm. mental coach, who, uh, I mean, does both. Helps me deal with the, just the the, the plain everyday mentality of you know dealing with good times with bad times, um, because. I struggled a lot, like especially when I first started in Formula One. I struggled a lot when I was bad. I freaking hate losing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I hate it so much. <laughs> um, but I struggled a lot because when you think of like, um, I mean, I was young, what, 19. And when you're then suddenly into it and you're like, at times you think, I've never been that, like, I'm not this kind of guy that's super confident and like, I have so much belief in myself and all this. Mm -hmm. Like, Suit some people, doesn't suit some people. It doesn't suit me. I've always been a very realistic, like, I don't think I'm good at this. I'm going to try. I'll do my best. But my mentality is like that, right? But you seem so, comfortable with that. I mean, you seem chill. I'm fine with it because it's you just me. Like, like yeah. I'm used to it. Yeah, I've, yeah. I've grown up with that. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like there's just so many stereotypes people feel like you have to be. 
Uh, and I don't think it's true. I don't think, I think it's maybe some are better than others mm -hmm. and some uh, on average are better for different sports and all these things. But um, I think if you you understand how you work, as long as you understand how you work, whether it's different to everyone or not, if you understand how you work and what's best for you, what isn't, I think that's the most important thing. Then you can work in whatever way you want. You can think in whatever way you want, as long as you know how to get the best out of yourself. Um, and I think that's what I struggled to do in the beginning was that sometimes I struggled a little bit and I'll go to a race weekend and I just, I wouldn't be quick enough. And I just think like, you know, even then I was like, you know, what happens if the next race I'm not good either? And then the next one and like, I, then I'm like, what happens if I'm not in Formula One in two years? Like, what do I do? I'm not good at anything else in life, <laughs> you know? And like, I got to the point of thinking about all these. Not even things, golfing, like, apparently. Baseball. And then you're thinking of it every weekend. I'm like, I, I hope I'm better this weekend because I don't want to deal with just the pain of of not being quick enough. Um, so I did struggle. And then it's just playing on your mind 24-7. You're like, what should I have done better? How can I do this better? How can I do that better? And I'm a, I'm a big overthinker. So I just, I think all the time too much, but sometimes it's a good thing. And, um, now I know I'm in a much better place of understanding, like, um, what affects me, what doesn't, what's good for me, what isn't. Um, so I'm always very happy to like people n know me, I guess a little bit for criticizing myself a lot. Yeah. Um, a lot. <laughs> I am, <thanks. laughs> um, and I get like there's like that you shouldn't say bad things because then you believe in them and all of that stuff. But I'm, I get that a little bit, and I 100% I agree with certain things. But also some when I just, um, you know, like guitar. Like people don't want me to talk about guitar, but I'm happy to talk about it. Like I messed up quali, both my qualifyings. Um, I should have been P2 or P1 at worst. Mm -hmm. Like I would say easy. I should have quite easily been able to do these two things mm -hmm. um they became very costly because and i was so annoyed at that time because one is for a p1 or a p2 like how you know my job is to go out there not to make mistakes and then when i'm quick enough to be in that position sometimes all you have to do is lift you know lift one percent <laughs> and you know you give up half a tenth and even that i still would have been good enough for p2 or p1 and it's hard to drive under the limit sometimes and i'm not that kind of guy i just i need to still adjust and i think it's one of the things i need to focus on is sometimes settling for not being the best like not 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 not, not being the best but like not going for pole or not just trying to win and i don't think i always try and do that but sometimes i do um and uh sometimes it's yeah can you drive at 99 percent today and not at 101 kind of thing mm -hmm. but 60% of the time, 101% works, but then the other time it, you pay the price. Um, but I was frustrated because I was like, this is our opportunity to maybe win a race, to be on the podium again. Um, and I know what I'm capable of. I knew I was capable of being on pole or being second place in qualifying. So of course, I'm not going to be happy. Like I struggle to just come in then and go, yeah, I made a mistake, you know, <laughs> wonderful. I look forward to tomorrow. Uh, I was just, I was annoyed with myself and I was just, um, yeah, disappointed. Yeah, with I remember when racing F3 that you, you thought you were going to, you were expecting to qualify pole for about like half a second. You qualified <laughs> pole by, for like two tenths uh -huh. and you were like angry, like, you know. <laughs> yeah, but it's like, just, but... it's just, I think it's, I don't know if it's the same with every driver, but you know what you should have done, right? Mm -hmm. You have that feeling of, I could have done better there, 100%. And I could have done better, I could have done this. So when you come in and you're like, of course, when you're pole, then in the end of the day, you're just like, I'm happy. <laughs> but when you, you know you should have achieved something and didn't, like that's what hurts, right? Yeah. That's what hurts you as a competitor. Um, and I'm, I'm the competitor. I want to win everything. I hate losing. I Yeah. And that, that kind of mentality behind it all. So I get very disappointed with myself when I don't do the job that I should have done. But I don't think it affects me in a bad way. I maybe talk a little bit less with people because I'm just uh -huh. like, shut up. <laughs> but I'm also just like... Again, I, I overthink. I'm like, yeah. why did I do that? I should have done this. Like, all I did needed to do was lift a little bit and just give up something to to achieve it. Um, and that's just one of the things generally that I'm working on. But at the same time, I think growing up, being so hard on myself has helped me definitely become a much better driver than what I would have been 
if I was like just not hurt by losing. And I think that the hurt of losing um, is, is pay, it's a painful one. Mm -hmm. And I think that drives me and motivates me to think about things very carefully to make sure it almost doesn't happen again. Um, I sort of went on to then have some good races and uh, finish on the podium and things like that. But it's just those missed opportunities. You're like, damn, mm -hmm. if, if only I lifted this much or was I kept within the line by this like much, a different, what a different decision story it would be. And, um, and that's just frustrating. Like that, that, that hurts me, but it's not in a bad way. It's just, I'm just thinking of it so much. And when I think, and I don't want to talk and all of these things, but, um, some people deal with it better than others. And I think I'm maybe a bit on that worse side of it. Um, and of course, when there's always TV and cameras, like it's, it's hard to just go into straight in into interview, you know, how was that, you know, and, oh, great. and smile about it and, uh -huh. and be happy. And I think it's the same in any sport. People hate losing. Um, and if you had a microphone in, in front of someone one minute after every football game and after every tennis match and after like losing a the final. guys don't just come in happy and complacent, like, you know, oh, yeah, I'll do better next time and blah, blah, blah. I think, um, I think it's a good thing to be tough on yourself and, and those things. And I think it's made me who I am and made me a better person and better driver. Um, but of course there's always things I want to improve on and do better on and, uh, and all those things, but working with like a the, the mental coach on these types of things is for me helped me a lot and very important um yeah and again help me do you ever yeah, cry on those situations cry yeah like get into your room and just like fuck and you know <laughs> i know i don't cry much i i think i've been like i'm i've been slightly emotional guy at times but <laughs> not emotional in the sense that i cry like, i don't cry over movies and things like that i'm not that kind of guy but um i say i'm more just shout and like anger rather than cry or crying of desperation or no no nah, i would no not even like when you won like the junior championships or something i mean like yeah i mean i probably i cried when i was younger probably yeah, yeah. i did cry when i was young i know i've, I've known danny since 2016 january Le new zealand no, no i knew really that late not in karting no, I, actually, the first time I, I met you was uh, when you were doing Ginetas that I had. Uh, I was working with another Brazilian driver, but we did like three races in the season. Yeah. And then I started working with Dev, and my first job with him was New Zealand. 2016. 16, yeah. Oh, wow, eight years. Eight years. Seven years. Yeah, half your age. Damn, so Danny obviously knows some things about me that I didn't <laughs> know about myself. <laughs> I didn't even know. Oh, that, that was happened. so fun. Like, I was like, what the, I didn't even know there was a girl in this party. <laughs> like... So end of I don't remember. Part. It must have been a great party. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I guess. So, no, no, I, I was going to leave him to have some lunch. and. Yeah, of course. I mean, it's late already, but only one last question, a bit more Go on. to have a bit more fun. How, I mean, how did you feel wearing those outfits with James Gordon? Oh, the, uh, yeah. <laughs> this was one of those moments that I've gone... I never thought I'd be doing this in Formula One. Like, this is not what I saw on TV with Fernando Alonso and Lewis Hamilton, you know, 10 years ago, right? But, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Times have changed, apparently. And now they make us wear crop tops and walk down the paddock <laughs> in slow-mo. <laughs> um, but I mean, in Formula One, there's a lot of, there's a lot of great things. Like, I'm, I'm definitely never one to complain. Of course, I get upset and I get frustrated and disappointed over a lot of things. Um, some things I say wrong and I do wrong things, um, but that's never my intention. And for anyone who knows me, I think like I always try to have the best intention with everything. And um, I want to enjoy my life as much as possible in whether I'm at the track, whether I'm in the paddock or whether I'm at home or whatever. You know, I want to have fun and enjoy every every moment. But I also know yeah, that I'm not perfect, right? And I've, I've made my fair share of mistakes and all those things. Um, but... Uh, yeah, it's it's tough. Like, there's a lot of perks of Formula One, and uh, of course, a lot of that is you know you work with great partners and they get free things yeah. and um, you get to drive cool uh, McLarens and drive cool cars. You meet, and I think the best thing is then you meet great people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you either you bump into them at the racetrack because you have you know guests and celebrities who are there, or you have events and there's other people there and they put you in, you're in contact and then you create something together or you do this together and just the opportunities that also 
outside of the outside of Formula One, the opportunities that come up because of people you meet and things like that are are also a lot of fun. And I know Formula One is like my life and my priority, but there's also enough time for every driver mm -hmm. in Formula One to do things outside of Formula One, you know? And I think people get criticized when they do things outside of yeah, Formula yeah. One. Um, it doesn't mean they don't care about Formula One. It's just there are days in a year where people can do other things. Um, you're human after all. And you're human, yeah. you know? Like, I love Formula One and I love, mm -hmm. like, I dedicate my life to wanting to be the best driver in the world at this. Um, but uh, yeah, I still want to have a good time with my friends when I go home and, and, You know, of course, every every now and then have a party and these are like, it's normal. It's, it's you want to do normal things and um and enjoy your life, but you have to set your priorities right. You know, and um that's one thing that I made a few mistakes on at times, and <laughs> now I'm in a definitely a much better place. But um, yeah, I'm never one to take for granted the position that I'm in. If that makes sense, I'm never one to like I've made it in life. Mm -hmm. Like I've never thought of that in my life. Yeah, uh, how do you feel always, like like having someone that you've seen when you were a child like for example Beckham yeah that you saw like national team shining in a world cup yeah w going to your box and watching you like as yeah. a fan you know like how, how do you see I mean, that you know so I I guess I grew up watching like Beckham for example um I knew of him I didn't know like that much about him right yeah you're not much and now I've I've watched the Beckham documentary mm -hmm. and like I didn't know personally I didn't know how big he was like Probably for for Ayrton to Brazil mm -hmm. was kind of like Beckham in and England, yeah. right? Um, a similar sort of 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 thing. And I didn't know how big he was, like the influence he had over the the world, or or, or but I say the world and also England. Um, you realize the things he like the bad times he's gone through and the the good things as mm -hmm. well. Um, but to have someone like that who is in that position, who is uh, who has so much influence over people. Um, such a hard worker and a, and a dedicated guy his whole life to to that job um so then like eventually being in my position of you know meeting him and having chad and kind of just being like mates and him being the position of a fan like and him like watching my pit stops and like, mm, yeah <laughs> you know like it's 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 wrong i still find it weird at times i i still i do still find it like i still remember me being the kid watching it on tv going like how cool is that how cool is that yeah. i was watching fernando and, and lewis 2007 and now i'm in that i mean i'm racing those guys mm -hmm. weird uh, and i still find odd sometimes but yeah just being in that position of of having influence over people mm -hmm. you know like kids watching me and people watching me and cheering me exactly. on exactly that's what i was gonna ask about mexico it was such like a very nice scene about the, yeah. the, the little mexican kid, yeah, the kid like crying when he Smiling. saw you and all like i saw that you were a bit like you didn't know how to react no, even I mean, like just, I, yeah i just still find it i still feel normal right i still feel like i just love doing formula one because i love to drive mm -hmm. that's why i can never call it a job because it's not a job it's not like i'm being forced to do it I want to do it and I'm lucky that then I get paid and I get to do all these things and I get to do what I love in my life. And I think I'm lucky to, to be given that opportunity. Um, but when you have like a, a kid that like, you know, that was me, what, probably 10 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, 15 years ago, um, that I have an in, in, that kind of influence on, on someone that I can, I make them cry <laughs> in a good way. Yeah, yeah, of um, course. And, you know, I make their day or their week or their month or year, whatever it is. Like, um, that's something very special. That's what I would say almost genuinely one of the best bits about it, um, is that it's, is seeing this response and, and having that feeling, which I think is very hard to match in any other way of life is having that feeling of making people happy. Um, it's like such a, it's, it's such a rare thing I would say, but, um, It's like my biggest motivation, like my biggest thing that makes me smile every day or every weekend is when you have moments like that, when you're like, how, how mm -hmm. nice is that? Like, mm -hmm. you just made that kid happy and um, yeah, it's, it's just rare that you feel that in any other way of life, I would say. So mm -hmm. it's, I still find that odd that mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm just in like, that position. what do I do? I just drive a car. <laughs> uh, so stop crying. <laughs> uh, but it's... Um, It's still, yeah, very cool. Still a long way to go, but where, where do you see yourself like after Formula One? Like, what is your 
I heard this for a long time. No, no, no. It's, it's for like, sure it yeah. is. But like after that, like what do you see? Have, have, does it cross your mind? Like I'm gonna be a golfer, or I don't know. I'm gonna <laughs> leave somewhere. Uh, and I mean, this... there's, there's still plenty of things I want to do outside of Formula One. You know, I have my my esports team quadrant. Um, so I still have a big passion. I'm still a gamer, and I still mm -hmm. love doing these types of things. I love golf. I love other sports. Um, uh, I don't know. Spend time with my kids one day. <laughs> uh, probably, yeah. I don't know. Uh, and and racing wise, like, is there any specific race or series that you envy? Like, the, yeah, I want to do. Like I want to do Indy 500. Or... I love Le Mans. Le Mans. Yeah, oh, it's cool. the coolest. I mean, I love Indy, like IndyCar, Indy, Indy 500. I know it's one that everyone speaks about, and it's Triple Crown and all of that stuff. But um, just doesn't tickle me. <laughs> no. The same way, like Le Mans does. Uh -huh. Um, I mean, I did Daytona 24 hour, mm -hmm. 2017 with Fernando and, and, uh, Phil Hansen. I was there too. Um, you were there. Yeah. And, uh, I love that. That was one of the, my best times. I love the team side of things. I, I think I'm, I try to be very much a team player and I love, mm. you know, like when you're on the podium and you have the whole team down there smiling and celebrating, mm -hmm. like I love that. And I hate the, I hate the reversal of it. I hate like. When I made a mistake in qualifying or a race and I'm out of the race and you come back and you're like, man, they have to rebuild the car and mm -hmm. take it all apart and yeah. make all these new bits. Like that thing gets me so annoyed. Mm -hmm. And then the complete reversal and the contrast of when you're on the podium, you're seeing them, you're like, damn, I just made them all proud. You know, that's mm -hmm. like, a, it's a very cool moment. So my, my motivation is, is my team. Um, and it's, yeah, they're very much the same way with anything, like mm -hmm. the happy you can make them, the, the happier I am kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay, let's... So I guess that's it, man. Yeah, that's Thank it. you Enough. so much for the interview. Have some barbecue Bro. now and uh, get ready for another, another one. race. Another race. Two races. Thank you very much, Three brother. Huh? Thank you very much. High five. High five, man. You're going to leave me hanging. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you I very much. I hope the Brazilian racing gods bless you. Yes. And you... With not, hopefully not this much rain. <laughs> 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 But, well, bom, só não esquece aí de entrar no site da Exo. Obrigado, Exo. Obrigado, Zul. Obrigado, Stapar, pela parceria aí. É, vamos aí para mais um final de semana. Brasil, with one of our Brazilian drivers on the grid. And, yeah, true. Valeu. Pega aí, eu não tô conseguindo. Just a gift. <laughs> <laughs> you have to remind you of it. <laughs> from from Buzz. From the Buzz. I know you like hoodies, so... I'm, I'm a hoodie and I'm a hat guy. I'm Buzz, a hoodie and a hat guy. Buzz hoodie. It's a bit big, Thanks. but um, it's comfy. Just just pretend I'm hugging you when you when you wear it. That and also a gift from e Exto. Which is our ah, sponsor. Gifts, it's amazing. Our family dash sponsor. Another hat. Oh, more. Oh, you no, better buy no, you better no, have a couple of hats. Kind of stuff. <laughs> talking <laughs> travel kit. Travel kit. Towel for you to Oh, I was looking for one of them. <laughs> to wipe. It's for my golf clubs, no? And for you for your racing notes. Oh, my notepad. I actually need a new notepad. Perfect. Now you have one. Thank you very much. With the pen, it comes with the pen as well. Thanks guys. Thank you very much, man. Thank you. Obrigado, obrigado. Valeu, Alex, pessoal, obrigado a Zoom. Like me, caralho, por favor. Só para uma última coisa que eu esqueci de comentar da Azul Mais, além de tudo que eu te falei, você pode contratar tag é, de pedágio, pedágio, sem mensalidade, contratar seguro, enfim, baixa lá, entra na plataforma, dá uma fuçada que vocês vão, vão gostar bastante, tá bom? Os caras tá bom nisso, viu? Puta que pariu. Pô, tô gostando de fazer isso. <risos> tô precisando arrumar mais patrocinador aí. Valeu. Pra gente anunciar. Obrigado, pessoal. Tamo valeu, junto. Valeu, valeu. Abraço. Hasta luego. Uh! Fuck man, the ring uh, disconcentrated yeah, a bit, yeah. man. <laughs> Fuck. And the lightning and thunder. Oh, like no, fuck. and the things flying.